Hey gang, it's been a little bit. Um, I'm working on a, pardon me, blue book page. Nothing too spoilery on here. Just three very similar looking guys um, <laughs> talking. What's weird is uh, sometimes when you're doing like sort of um, historical books or fat fact based books, when you're doing fantasy, you can sort of des you know, design your comics and your characters however you need them to be. Um, I ran into this really interesting, weird thing where these characters, these are three historical guys. Um, one dude is named Fred Crimson. The other is uh, something Dahl. I forget his first name, D-H-A-L. Um, and uh, Kenneth Arnold. And uh, Kenneth looks a little bit different than the other two, but Dahl and Crimson look so much the same. One just looks like the other version of the other guy maybe 30 years in the future, but somehow with more hair and thicker eyebrows. Um, so I had to like pick out specific um, characteristics of each of them so that I can make them look a little different, but it was a real challenge. It was really weird. Um, the way I drew these pages, <clears throat> there you go. I, uh, I just laid them out on a regular photocopy paper. What I did was I printed out the actual size of the cropping marks and then I just drew them in pencil here and went over them with um, a uh, non-repro blue pen. I'm sorry, no, I'm thinking of something else, uh, which is a regular um, uniball pen. And uh, I don't know, there's something that I really like. Sometimes it's, it's a matter of shifting back and forth between analog and digital stuff that keeps my brain fresh, but I really like this stage. This is almost my favorite time of drawing is I'm just sketching stuff out and using a pen. I don't know why that particular aspect of it. Um, I, know, I really like it a lot. It's almost my favorite thing. Um, now we're going to get in. What I did clearly was then I scanned this in. Um, and now I'm just going to get into inking. Working in Clip Studio. Um, I tend to think that the, this particular brush that I'm using um, in order to sort of imitate my analog style, <clears throat> which I'm trying specifically to do here, I try to use thicker lines than I normally would. And I find somewhere between like a 30 and 40 brush size um, seems to help. So um, what I really like is the, one of the reasons why I go over it with that pen that I was showing you is it just breaks out all of my shapes. So you can see all the drawing, the, the, the main information except for here. Is, is really on here and it's done. Um, and then I just kind of indicate for myself where some shadows will go, some spots, some specifics, some places I'm, I'm, I'm very loose. Um, so basically all the information is here for me to just go ahead and start thinking. I wanted to do, I'm gonna use a different brush in the, in the foreground here. Um, to almost give it a sense of like, uh, Um, like it's out of focus. So I'm going to use this dry brush. Yeah, all right. I'm going to use this dry brush here on this outline. I don't want to go too far with it, so I'm keeping it subtle. Like I, if I used a, a really thick line here, you can start to tell. I just don't want, actually, that's, that's pretty good. I just don't want to call too much attention to itself. So hopefully this comes off as some sort of waitress. And if not a waitress, then it's just somebody putting dishes away. I'll put the stabilization a little bit. Stabilizer is a fun tool, especially when you're working. Um, on glass, basically, and that's what this, you know, what a Cintiq is, and, um, you know, you can get these sort of fake, uh, this thing called paper-like, um, and it's a filament that you can put over the screen, so it gives it more of a paper-like feel, um, because otherwise your pen, like, slides around so easily, it, um, it's hard to get a, a straight line or consistency in your line, um, 
it's just so different and it, it can really throw you off especially if you're not mentally prepared for it um, that it just doesn't feel like paper um, or if you're like me and you go back and forth between pen and paper a lot you'll experience this sort of disconnection um, so and the stabilizer just helps the pen stay well more, more stable I have a, a very good stable hand when I'm drawing or when I'm inking um, but not so much digitally unless I'm using the stabilizer. And that's what these tools are here for, you know. I'm not going to ink this full page today. I'm just going to get into it a little bit. Alright, so let's fill this stuff in. Nice detail in the foreground. I'll go in and clean up these little bits and stuff here later. One of the things you'll hear me talk about often is how speed, I don't want to say speed, I want to say this forward momentum is really important when you're working. Um, oftentimes when I have something that doesn't work out, instead of uh, really working on it hard and digging in, I'll leave the mistake where it is, or the, the, the subpar art or inking where it is. And like, let's say I'm not happy with this face, I'll just put like an arrow next to it. And then I move on. And when I come back and I look at the face again, sometimes it's actually fine. It's just some sort of weird thought or doubt that I had at the time. Um, and then other times, yeah, I'll come back and then, then I work on it. Um, but if you, I, I notice for myself, if I stop to try and fix the things that I'm not happy with as I'm working on it, what happens is it just kills all my momentum, all the forward movement, um, and it eats into my either confidence or, um, yeah, it just slows everything down. It kills the page. So... Um, just move on. Take note of it and move on is what I say. It's really interesting working with historical figures too. Um, I'm not really capturing uh, Kenneth Arnold, or the first reported UFO witness really in modern history. I'm not quite capturing him here. He's a big, big dude. He's pretty interesting, um, like visually. Like he looked like he could have been a movie star or something. He's fairly handsome, really big build. I've seen him next to other people, got other people, and he's just this huge dude. Um, like he was sort of made for the part, you know. Meaning he was like a, a media sensation at the time. He was a pilot who, uh, in 1947, flying, I think, between Washington and Oregon, in between Mount Adams and Mount Rainier, saw these weird objects in the sky that were not saucer-shaped. You know, they, were, they were called flying saucers because he described them as like skipping over the air if you threw a, a saucer like that, but they're actually these kind of like wing-shaped things. Um, and what's interesting and, and really gets reported with this story for some reason is there's like days later, some other guy took a picture of the thing that he described and um, they very much matched the descriptions of, of like an early version of the triangle-shaped UFOs. And the triangle-shaped UFOs typically have this like light right in the middle um, so this photo that was taken was exactly the shape that he was talking about. This sort of almost looked like a batarang, um, and it clearly had a light down the middle. Now I don't know that these things are, are UFOs or alien things, or I have a strong suspicion that it's um, some advanced technology that, for whatever reason, hasn't really been rolled out 
publicly, um, even since the 40s. So some people suspect that there's some form of anti-gravity going on. I know it sounds all crazy, but you know, I don't think people are seeing nothing. I just don't know what it is that they're seeing, even back then. So yeah, these guys are, are interesting to draw because, like I said, they have similar uh, facial features, and their hair was the same. Um, so you kind of have to really work to make it to make them look individual. I'm not super happy with the face here. Uh, less so with uh, Kenneth Arnold here. This really doesn't quite look like him, so I'm going to have to work it. His face is just meatier. Um, this might have been him when he was like 20 or something like that. But I'll go back and work on it. Look, I predicted I wouldn't like that face. Line work, you know, some basic stuff. Always thinking about thin to thick. Light is coming from up here, so the, the line work is thicker below, underneath things. Here we go. Um, it's definitely going to need a, a panel, I mean, a, a background in this panel because the previous page, um, let's see if I can find it here if I open it up. Page 16 also ends in a diner. Um, so this has to be a very different looking diner, but also identifiable in the 50s. So it'll be interesting to see um, if I can pull it off. And it's not the best. There's there's another shot. Uh, let's try page fifteen. A classic man in black. I don't like this face up here. I'm gonna have to rework it. I don't like the face. I don't like the way I ink this. This I'm trying to do that thick line that you see in Alex Tove's work, and it's making a nice comeback with a lot of artists. Um, sometimes I can hit it and sometimes I don't. Um, here it just looks flat. Like it looks like some sort of weird cutout, almost like Patrick Nagel art or something. <laughs> uh, anyway. Here's this diner, which I'm tracing from a real diner called the Majestic, which I thought was interesting because of Majestic 12. I'm going to sort of tie into that. I can't draw cars, so I'm usually using, um, I mean, I can draw cars, but you know what I mean. So I'm either using photos or I'm using um, 3D programs. Um, and then, you know, when you're using photo reference, you, ch you choose what parts you're going to use, what parts you aren't. Um, you got to really make it your own. And you also have to be careful what you're using, et cetera, et cetera. Just always be careful. <laughs> um, so anyway, the point is it's going to have to look a very different looking diner. i got to figure out how to do that. Uh, this face is going to be fun. So here I'm going to have the light coming this way. It's going to be darker on this side of his face. Yeah, I think that worked. Kenneth Arnold has a distinctive nose. It's really interesting. I've, I've worked on, um, a, at this point, a bunch of um, either biographical stuff or pseudo biographical stuff or just stories that involved real people um, and there's a very strange tendency to become attached to them um, not just as characters but because they were people or sometimes it's just the version of that of the character or the version of that person that you're portraying as a character and you become um, attached to them and that can be weird because <laughs> you know it's not the character it's not the real person that you're connected to it's the version of that person that you've created that you're connected to but that connection is partially because they were a real person um, Betty and Barney Hill I, I felt really strongly attached to as I was working on them um, being from my parents generation maybe even slightly older uh, um, by my parents, me, my mother, and my aunt and uncle, um, I felt very connected to them. 
um, especially uh, Betty. Um, yeah, it was like really sad drawing them in their older age and um, very sweet trying to make them feel like a real connected husband and wife because they really truly did love each other through throughout their life. Barney sadly passed too young. Um, and yeah, I mean, they become real to you. Um, I'm also working with, with Taki on a fictional biography of, of Van Gogh, um, or we're calling it a post, post-realism, post-impressionistic uh, biography of Van Gogh. Um, and, you know, we're using facts, but we're also, you know, filling in a, a lot on our own. And uh, I'd like to think that he'd be happy with that. Partially because we're, we're not focusing in on his um, mental struggles. We're just, just treating him as a fully rounded human being who is more than that one thing. Um, we don't ignore it, but it's certainly not the focus of, of what we're doing. Um, and in my mind's eye, I think he, he approves of what we're doing because we're giving him an adventure. I think he would like that. And I think he'd like the fact that somebody was interpreting his life the way his artistic mind interpreted the, the world around him. Um, and that happens with these guys, too. It, it's, it's interesting. Um, like there are some characters in here, and I don't want to call them out because it's, you know, we're putting two and two together with a lot of stuff. But, you know, some of these guys faking what they saw or what they knew. Um, or maybe not. Maybe they were being used by other people with information. Um, I think a lot of like the UFO um, field, um, there's a lot of disinformation in the UFO field. And by that, I don't mean conspiratorial, crazy dark stuff. Um, I think that the US government is just made of secrets. And um, if you can use something like um, a UFO sighting to cover up your um, secret technology or your new plane or whatever it is, um, use it. Would they, they would use it. It makes sense. So I think that's part of the mystery that, that goes in here is that there's a lot that even if, you know, there aren't aliens visiting us or something extra dimensional or extra special happening, uh, the government certainly is happy to use that facade, you know, to help obscure projects, secrecy, money. And I don't even mean it in a nefarious way. It just makes sense. Anybody who's worked in the government would talk about like all these sort of firewalls they have between each other and stuff. And, you know, I think a lot of it is just habit, you know. Sometimes when you hear no comment, they know that that no comment is going to say a lot by saying nothing. And it makes sense to use that to sort of obfuscate the things you need to keep quiet. Especially because there's money usually involved for somebody, government grants and stuff like that. It's not always like secrecy for good reasons. Sometimes it's secrecy because, you know, you're getting somebody's getting paid somewhere along the way. Just human stuff, nothing. Nothing that nefarious. Probably all just comes down to money. So this guy is uh is he Chrisman? I forget. But anyway, this is this is the dude that he looks a, a lot like the other dude. He just has thicker eyebrows. So I'm really emphasizing his eyebrows. Even more so than he really has. Seems like there's just a lot of these like cornbread Midwestern dudes with big football like builds and same shape heads and <laughs> facial features. I don't know why. Nah, I don't love this face. But again. 
I'm not going to sit here and struggle. I'm going to move forward. Like uh, 20 minutes in, we're almost a third of the page done. Almost. And a lot of that comes from, um, like I said, uh, forward momentum. Just keep going. Made a mistake. Okay, we can fix it later, especially digitally. Adding some heavy heaviness below, below, below the shapes. This will be fun. So I think this is also what I call that sort of a um, I call it the coloring book stage, uh, where basically I'm just doing the outlines of the figures, almost like a big coloring book. These figures are bigger, so I'm going to get this these lines to be larger, thicker. Also, when I'm using these lines, I'm trying to think of what tool I want it to be. And I know if I was inking this, I'd be inking it with this uh, Bemoji uh, pen. This is um, kind of a brush pen. It's got like a, a, a give to the top of it. Um, so you can get like a thick to thin. And what I do is I try and think of that. I keep that in mind when I'm inking so that I can hopefully really sort of imitate the effect of that line. Because um, again, at least in my case, I'm not trying to evoke the digital feel of um, working in Clip Studio here. Other projects I have, um, if you look at uh, uh, World of Krypton, um, I really embraced a very, very digital feel for all of that. Um, but in this case, some of the pages I'm drawing are analog. So I want to have this balance between the analog the analog pages and the digital pages. So that's why I try and trick my mind into thinking I'm working with a brush here. Kenneth Arnold's face. Again, really interesting cat. Oops. I'm going to save the details um, until after I've done more of the face here um, because they're a little bit finer than the size brush I'm using. It's interesting, pretty much everybody in the 50s wore suit, um, wore collared shirt at all times. Um, even when they were like casual. So I have to do a lot of sort of calculation in my head. Is when is somebody wearing a shirt? When are they wearing a t-shirt, um, which is rare? When are they wearing um, a collared shirt but no tie? When are they wearing a tie? When are they wearing a suit and tie? Um, it's almost like you're drawing another planet or another culture. You know, you got to keep those things in mind. Hats. Every dude wore a hat. Like you ever watch footage of like New York in the, the 50s or something, like everybody has a hat.
I often wonder how much of that was like a, a sense of conformity that was comforting, and how much of it was conformity out of pressure. By comforting, I'm, I'm like I'm always aware that these guys are coming out of World War II. You know, if you're if you're drawing or writing somebody from 1950 or the 60s, chances are they served in World War II um, or Korea shortly after. Um, that's just a, a different mindset, a generation that was at war. Um, so yeah, some of that conformity that you see, like in our view, my view, growing up in the 80s, it always seemed like, oh, this sort of mindless, you know, um, everybody needs to be the same kind of thing. But you have to remember context, and you know, when you're writing or drawing these people, they lived through World War II, and it's not that far off of their, their heads, out of their minds. So that conformity might have been comforting, as opposed to um, some sort of cult-like <laughs> vibe, however it was that I, that I looked at it most of my life. But I don't know. I'd have to ask somebody. Got a call. Hold on. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. I love you too. Bye bye. Wrong number. All right. Uh, this is a good place to wrap it up. You know, I'll get in here with the faces a little bit later, but uh, well, let's just do this guy's face. Get a little bit smaller. I guess that's, so I'm at like a size 46. I'm going to bump this down to around 30. There we go. I really like giving the pen a little bit of a bouncy feel. So I'm pushing in lightly and lifting up. You get really nice little variations out of that. Oh yeah, this is the guy with the see the guy? I'll have to check the script. To see which is the guy with the thicker glasses or eyebrows. <laughs> it's the only way to tell these two dudes apart. I should have uh, prepared uh, little JPEGs. Maybe if I do a second a second part of this video, I'll um, I'll, I'll have those ready. And I'll show you guys their faces. Anywho, yeah, I'm gonna do more details on this guy's face and stuff. But you know, this is the this is the out the um, what I call the coloring book phase. So often, what I'll do is. I will then create a new layer on top of that and lower the opacity way down. I'll make my stability really low and the brush much bigger and um, you know then I'll look for shadows. Just loose, not too worried about it, just thinking about how to give it depth. And then you know I'll go back. And then I'll start placing in the shadows like that. That's not going to be it, but you know, I'm just giving you an example as a uh, as I go along. Um, all right, that's it for now. I will either post the finished page of this when it's done, or um, maybe when I'm doing the blue tones, I'll do a second video for that. And. Uh, that's it for now. Take care, guys.